This week's One Door Studios update, we join Arthur Bavellis from Family Office Insights for one of the most comprehensive webinars about our business plan our investors have ever seen. Join us as we jump straight to the details. Uh, so let's dive into a little bit of how we work. Um, as far as we can tell, as far as One Door Studios, we can tell we are really the first company uh, to be offering investments through crowdfunding into a major studio release global motion picture. Um, our business model is used by some of the most successful independent producers that are supplying films to the major studios. And one example is like a uh, Playtone, um, Tom Hanks's production company. He's independent, but yet he provides films to uh, the studios. So what is uh, differentiates these type of companies is they fully develop script, set up distribution contracts, brand tie-ins, and secure completion bonds and bank financing for the production costs. Uh, before the film is ever shot. Uh, but our company's additional edge is that the public can be involved from the start. Uh, what that does is it begins preloading of the film's fan base. And the kicker for our investors is that with our model, they're actually paid back their initial investment plus a percentage before the film is even shot. Well, you're asking how in the world can we do that? The reason we can do that is because the production budget that we get from the bank, uh, there's a line item that comes from uh, the production budget uh, that pays back our investors 110% of their initial investment before the film is ever shot. So it mitigates investor risk and carefully calculates every step of the filmmaking process uh, from the writing all the way up to distribution. Now, this is a huge differentiation between how we approach filmmaking and the majority of other independent filmmakers. Most indie filmmakers model is to get production funds, pr production funds from investors they get one or two semi-famous talent and then make the film usually from an underbaked story and a limited budget. And then after it's all through final editing, the movie's done, they start to shop around film festivals or anyone who will watch it for someone to buy it. And the buyers knowing that the money's already spent, the investors are kind of desperate to get their money back. Uh, they might lowball the producers and these type of films rarely ever make any money back uh, or any money at all. So we start uh, by opening up the development phase to investors. There's a differentiation between development and production. So the development phase is a $2 million uh, phase, which is a $2 million investor raise. During this phase, we do a few key things. Um, about a half million. So you see between one, month one and month uh, 18 is the development phase. That's it's kind of a moving target between 18 and 24 months is the development phase. Um, we start by opening it up to investors. About half a million dollars is set aside for scripting uh, the film. We engage an A-level scriptwriter, somebody who has done a major motion picture or TV series or both, someone who the studios would recognize as a writer of successful films, and, and another roughly three to five hundred thousand dollars is set aside to engage an A-level director, uh, and about this roughly the same amount for a main talent attachment. And the rest of the $2 million is for overhead during that phase. Um, so all these numbers are kind of a floating number because it depends on the final contract with the writer, the director to get the exact number, but it's an estimated $2 million for this entire process. And so this development phase is where we fully bake the script. We have it analyzed many times by industry experts uh, for its audience appeal to make sure the story really is going to appeal to uh, the global audience. This is a step that most indie filmmakers completely skip. Um, so what happens at the end of the development phase? Uh, I'm gonna tell you in just a second, but I'll preface it with two questions that you're probably already asking. Uh, how and when are investors paid back? And I actually already covered the other question earlier saying we actually, this calculated isn't our only project right now. We actually have eight other projects. And so in case you're thinking, well, we there's nothing else to invest in. You guys are already almost done. We actually do have other projects. So. Oh, sorry. Give me one second here. My, my screen keeps going nuts here on my computer and um, two seconds. Yeah, yeah take your time. Okay. So, you know, we if, oh, go if ahead. You guys don't mind. That is so important because the, the typical waterfall for film finance for an old guy like me that is traditional, you know, understands balance sheets and income statements mm -hmm. just was confounding. So what you're doing is super cool. Um, and I think it, uh, uh, warrants just a little bit more further explanation of how you actually be able to pull it off. Yep. Yep. So the first question is how and when are investors paid back? 
So we have a two tranche, two tranche return. Uh, at the end of the development phase, uh, we approach a, a production partner. You know, at the beginning of movies, you see like all these lists of production companies that had a, a part in making the movie. That's those are various production partners involved in the film. Um, we also uh, secure distribution contracts in the main nine major territories globally. We secure brand tie-ins, uh, production incentives from the localities where we're filming, and a completion bond. And all of this together acts as collateral for bank financing for the production costs. And a bank like Chase Bank, uh, or which has an entertainment department, or a bank like East West Bank, which, by the way, has already approached us to say, hey, look to us when it's time for your, for your bank financing. Uh, so the bank will provide us with the production loan of uh, the production cost. In, in the case of calculated, it's a roughly $50 million uh, budget. And within that production budget given to the bank, there's a $2.1 million line item, which pays the investors back plus 10% before the film is even shot. So this is how we mitigate our investors' risk. So they're receiving their initial investment back isn't dependent on the success of the film. It's just dependent on us getting production funding. So uh, if the film pr uh, profits, then they get a share in that as well. Uh, that's in the second tranche return. The investors are going to share in 50% of the net profits of calculated development. Now, calculated development is owned... Uh, Wonder Studios owns half of calculated development. So mathematically, that works out to the $2 million investor shares in 25% of the net profits of the film. Um, and this profit sharing starts roughly three to four months, depending on how soon the waterfall starts to flow in after the distribution. John can give more details on that one later. This is where the cynic always says, ah, yeah, they share in the net profits uh, doing Hollywood uh, accounting which usually ends up being nothing. We've heard that so many times. Um, this is the major difference between the way we do business and, and the, what the cynic is talking about. Um, so, uh, so we're not financed. This is the major difference. We are not financed by the studio. We're financed by the bank. We strike our deals direct with the distributors. And we have a collection agent in Vintage House, which is based in the, in the Netherlands. And they do the collect for us. And so the collection of the finance is for us. So there is no studio burden. When the studio funds your film production, there's a legal but very abusive line in the contracts, which if it goes unnoticed, you'll end up signing away your potential profits. And this is why people often refer to Hollywood accounting. Uh, when working with studios, they may follow the letter of the law, but they rob you blind in the contract. But we don't enter those contracts because we're not getting our production budget from them. We just have distribution deals with them. So we remain in control of the project. I hope that's that's clear. Um, so knowing that the production budget of this first film is roughly $50 million, you also might be asking, well, how can we be confident that the income of this film will even be as, as much as this given, you know, giving me any kind of return at all? Uh, that's where our comprehensive green lighting process uh, comes in. So before we even say, yes, this is a project we want to do as a company, uh, we do a very detailed green lighting process. Um, and we want to know if the profit to cost ratio will at least hit two to one for every dollar we spend on the film or every dollar spent in production, we could at least make $2 back. If our calculations say it's not going to be two to one, we don't even begin the project. And thankfully for calculated, um, the calculations have far exceeded uh, the two to one. And that's because the story uh, calculated has such mass appeal, uh, even though it's a YA or young adult novel series. The fans of it, we've discovered, range from uh, early teens all the way up into 70-year-olds. Absolutely love this story. The story just speaks to, to so many people. Um, additionally, there's no inappropriate uh, violence or sexual content in this. Our author, Nova McBee, was very clear about this. Uh, she wants the story to be, to be uh, entertaining for the sake of being a good story, not because there's all this nasty stuff that, that so many you know, uh, people put into films. Um, okay, so next, uh, you know, some people have objected that, uh, you know, this is One Door Studios' uh, flagship project, you know, and the name One Door Studios hasn't produced any motion pictures yet. And this does seem like a valid objection. And in fact, it's an objection I had before buying into this company. But when I looked at the individual experience of each one of us, uh, you know, the team members, the history 
of success in taking businesses from inception to acquisition. Or I look at the deals John Lee has has brokered, um, for example, acquiring the film rights and negotiating with Jerry Lewis for The Nutty Professor, or the relationships between he and the entertainment brands at Chase, Chase Bank, um, as well as the fact that his business model is taught in nearly every film school in the nation. I don't know, Jay, you have that, that book, um, the slide of that book. This is a book that John Lee wrote. Uh, the Business Producer's Handbook uh, is used in most film schools around the country and um, many international That's ones. Actually, well. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the business plan, John wrote the book on it. Um, so um, after looking at all that, additionally, we also own the film rights to this YA series that has been a bestseller on Amazon uh, several times. But married to this, all this business stuff is the vision of the company. I mentioned before, each one of us is a father. Uh, John takes the K because he's a father of six kids. Um, Jason comes in second, father of five kids, and I'm a father of four kids, all of the age of 14. So why is that important? Um, we know that generosity is important. And we decided early on that we were going to give 25% of our own profits as a company after investors are paid. 25% was going to go to combat child trafficking and exploitation since we're all fathers. So we've partnered with an organization called NCOSI or the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Uh, and they're on the forefront of combating child trafficking and the porn industry. Um, NCOSI will end up distributing uh, this 25% in three areas, prevention, of trafficking, rescue of those who've been trafficked, and rehabilitation of those who've been trafficked. So that's our vision. This is not about simply making successful films to make us rich and famous. It, it's about doing good in the world on the largest scale possible. So many of these organizations get their funding uh, through bake sales, Facebook fundraisers, uh, raising money tens of dollars at a time. I know this because I did the I did the fundraising video for one of these organizations that that rescues kids, and they literally have pickleball tournaments and bake sales to raise their money from you know from an army of people. And so we thought, what if One Door Studios could become the largest single donor uh, of any of these organizations that they've ever had? So. That's that's our vision. That's a little bit of an overview of our business model. And I hope I've made things clear for you. And uh, John, Jay, if there's anything you want to add before we open up to questions, um, feel free to hop in. Yeah, I, I think I think um, a couple of things. Thanks, Stephen. That was, that was really a good overview. Um, I think the most important thing, and maybe we should have started with that, is the story itself. And why right. calculated? And we did do a thorough green light on this, and we vetted things out very uh, with high science scrutiny uh, relative to their capacity to earn money. Uh, but we start out with with finding a story like the one we did here, which we negotiated on and competed for, um, because it is such a high profile and strong book. But the story itself is uh, of, a, of a young woman who is a math prodigy. Uh, and you kind of saw this in the, in the video at the, at the beginning. Um, but this, uh, the two books are, are published at this point. There are two more novels that are in the process of being published that will come out um, first of next year and just a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> and it's just a really fun, rollicking story. It's not only high, highly entertaining, but it also has something to say. Um, it's uh, and that for for us uh, is a crucial part of the of the ingredient of what it takes to get us to invest in the green lighting process and see um, what the earnings to cost ratio of a project might be, which is uh, finding out what its budget might be and then looking at uh, how much our share of the profits might be. And that's where our investors sit <laughs> in our share of, of that. It needs to be at least two to one in order to catch our interest. So the first thing though, is that this is just a really extraordinary story. And uh, I, I noticed a couple of people um, who have said that they've read the books. Um, at least one comment has come across our bow. <laughs> now, how much they like them. 
Um, but this is one of the biggest reasons that people invest in us. Uh, the business, the deal itself and the terms of the deal, very attractive. But I think for most people, if the story wasn't something that really moved them, uh, they wouldn't be as interested. So I think the majority of our investors are that way. And Steve mentioned that we're kind of ahead on our, our fundraising. When we started, our objective was to raise about, and, and this is our first time in crowdfunding. We've never done this before. And, and Jason heads up this end of it. But we had an objective of raising about 100000 a month. So $2 million would take us 20 months, basically. And now we're uh, about 10 months into this, and we've raised um, about, um, where are we at, 80%? 0.65. Yeah, we've raised, we've raised most of the capital. So we're way ahead of what our projections were. And a lot of it has to do with the story, as well as the experience of the crew and the deal terms as well. Having, uh, as Stephen mentioned, there hasn't been, as, as far as we know, an opportunity for a common person to, to invest in um, a major motion, a studio release motion picture. Um, there's There's been the big uh, packages that's come out from Disney, like Hollywood Partners, uh, but it takes, these are, are six-figure and seven-figure investors. Uh, but for, for smaller investors, uh, we have a couple of six-figure investors in us as well. But, um, you know, this is, this is a, a, a great opportunity. And uh, where could you go in a motion picture investment to get recover your money plus a, a 10% uh, before the picture goes into production? Just a note on that too, Stephen. Uh, there's a line item in the budget, but it, we spend about, of the $2 million, we spend about $1.8 million in production costs. So we spend about a half million dollars on the script. We spend, uh, we retain a, about a three to five million dollar uh, producer, and uh, to retain them, we have to pay ten percent of that. So that's three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. We get the cast too, same kind of way, ten percent of their fee, which might be seven figures. So most of the money, most of that um, one point eight million dollars, is for. Uh, for talent and and production expenses, so it, it uh, since we've advanced these production expenses, it's paid back out of the production budget, which is great. Uh, in addition to about a fifteen percent um, development fee um, for the work we've we've done, so that's more than enough to recover our investors. When we were uh, structuring what this investment might look like, we said, "Oh, we should do that." <laughs> that drives people crazy. They'll get their money back before it goes into production. Uh, and then we give them a nice uh, piece of the uh, of the profits as well, of the ongoing picture. And that makes for a pretty sweet, a pretty sweet package. John, one of my favorite things about our business model is um, if you could just comment briefly before we jump into the Q&A. Um, this 1.2 million, the attachment of the director and actors. When do we actually uh, need that that money to be used? It stays in in our account for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. It takes. Um, I think Stephen mentioned this. It takes seventeen to twenty two months to write the script, which might seem like a long time, <clears throat> but on studio level projects, um, in order to get it there, where you've you, and you know what it's like when you go see a movie. Uh, and sometimes we go to our living room <laughs> to see them now, but whether it's in a theater or not, um, it's just such an overwhelming story because the the script is so extraordinary. It's so excellent. It's uh, the term in the industry is that it's fully baked. Um, and that takes multiple writers often. There'll be a great writer maybe that starts with it and they put everything in it they can. Um, but it isn't quite where it needs to be. And another writer will come in and another writer, very common where there are three or four or five writers. Um, but it takes time and it isn't done until it's done. Uh, the most successful production company out there is Pixar, which used to be independent before Disney purchased them. Uh, but their success is primarily due to, to that. They're just so committed to stories 
that are just so mature and packed with entertainment and have something to say um, that people are just thoroughly entertained and uh, they walk away feeling like they've somehow been uh, fed. They've just had a great experience. And that's where social media comes in. And that's what all of us in the industry are all about. We want people to start texting their friends before they leave the theater saying, you've got to see this movie and I'll take you. <laughs> I don't mind seeing it again. I'll see it two or three times. Hey, John, anyway. if I might jump in for a second, there was a question yeah, yeah. somebody had and you were oh. answering it. I just want to make sure that they're, they're, they're satisfied with that. The answer is the question was, can you go through the accounting of two million and when and when and on what and where is it being spent? So just a little more specific. The first half a million of the two million is is for a script writer and then we're paying them to write the script during the 18 month process of development. That, of course, as I said, the 500,000, it's, it's a floating number depending on who the script writer is. Um, then the. Uh, another roughly a million dollars, million one point two, is for attachment fees uh, for the A-list director and A-list talent, and this is paid to them once there's a contract for. So it, it remains in our account until we actually have uh, those people on board, and that's usually not until the scripting is is nearly done. Am I right, John? About that? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> and even even the screenwriter, you might if if you know much about the business, you might say, well, best screenwriters are usually over a million dollars. And it's true for us as well. This five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars during development is augmented by the money that's paid when production begins. It's part of the screenwriting contract that we we sign with them at the very beginning. Uh, a portion of it's paid during development, and then a portion of it, often the bigger portion of it, uh, is paid uh, during production. But yeah. That's that's when, and and that's uh, basically how much most of the most of the two million dollars, about a million seven million eight. So one of the things I think might be instructive, and not to be negative but clear, is that what could get into the way of the hundred percent plus ten percent back. What would what would have to happen that would not cause that to happen for an investor? Yeah, the the thing that that uh, would would be the most likely thing to have happen is that the script wouldn't be there. It wouldn't get fully baked. It, it wouldn't be to the level that it needs to be in order to have the presence, and so it wouldn't pass a studio uh, a studio review. Um, and it's it's we've left enough time, but sometimes, frankly. Uh, uh, scripts are developed for three years, four years, even though we try and get them out between 17 and 22 months, they could go longer. And if that's the case, then they just have to keep writing. And so we we write on those scripts. And that would be the, the biggest thing. It wouldn't be a director, because if you can't get one, you can get another. And, and they're, you know, they're around, they're, they're guns for hire. But if they make a decision, not just based on how much money they get paid, but their quote, what they make picture to picture is based on how well the picture does in the marketplace. So they look at the script and, and, uh, and they, they know, experienced directors know, in fact, is this, is this really strong? Is it ready to be produced? Will it be uh, for, for big global audiences, which now are about 2.4 billion uh, globally, um, you know, will, will this in fact move into that global marketplace and and have the kind of earnings and the reach that that it should have? And John, uh, if I if I could experience. jump in, what was that? I was just saying experience. They know what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, if the script is in good order, yeah. Stephen, could you just touch on maybe a quick little update since you've been doing all our updates on our on WeFunder on on the writer because it's it's really important that we have a writer who's at that level as well. So uh, the the first writer we ever approached uh, was actually the the Russos who uh, did Endgame, the Avengers Endgame, and their whole team read the stories and they got on a conference call this afterwards. They called us a meeting with us afterwards to to because they were just thought the story was just white hot. Um, and ultimately, because of you know schedule conflicts and, and whatnot, they ended up having to 
sadly turn us down. Um, but we've had such great reviews from them as well as Lieta Calagridis, who wrote Alita Battle Angel. These are top level writers that just think the story is, is outstanding. Um, the, the trouble in the industry right now is there's 170 productions happening simultaneously right now. Hmm. Uh, and there, there's usually about 40, 50, something like that. So the industry is, is Thank saturated. You COVID. Hmm. What's that, Jay? Th- thank you, COVID. <laughs> yeah, COVID did that. Uh, so there's so many productions happening simultaneously. So the issue is, isn't, isn't, are we going to get a writer? It's just when are we going to get the, the writer of this caliber? We, uh, we've kind of mitigated that issue by we've gone to an agent in the UK who has connections with a lot of talent. And so we're going out to uh, about eight to 10 writers at the exact same time right now, instead of one by one, we were giving them exclusives as a courtesy to say, Hey, we'll let you read the story. We'll only go to you. That way is not to offend, you know, them as a writer. So um, we're going out to about 10 writers right now, all of them, a list. Uh, our list is, is fairly long in that we have uh, writers right now. So uh, importantly, we're not going out to them with offers um, yeah. because we can't frankly, but she's taking them out, which is really smart move, a really smart strategy. She's going out just to see if they're available. And we can do that. We can go out to multiple uh, writers. And so if they're available, then we're going back to the ones that we have um, as our the top writers first uh, with offers. Yeah. And Jay mentioned you know, COVID. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. No, go ahead. Jay mentioned COVID. And that I forgot that was one of the questions we've been asked quite a bit is oh, what about COVID environment? You know, theaters are closed and and uh, we have contingencies for all that. Disney is the best example because they released Mulan right in the middle of COVID. And uh, they didn't go to the theaters. They went uh, direct to streaming. So the, the they thought they'd try, hey, $29.99 to, to watch the movie with your family. That probably costs less than going to the movies. How many people are going to do it? Uh, John, you got the numbers. Uh, how many millions of households downloaded Mulan or, or streamed Mulan? Yeah, a, a bunch. Enough in order to earn them opening weekend, about 125,000 or 125 million. million. Um, which is just really extraordinary to put it in context. If they were at the theaters, they, they would get less than half because the theater keeps half. uh, And then uh, there's direct distribution expenses and other things. Uh, So this direct to consumer, uh, they call it premium streaming, um, (laughs) but it's very powerful for them. It comes direct to them. They, they it, it grossed uh, 125 million and they got oh 125 million. <laughs> it was it was so powerful. It 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 reshaped literally um, Disney's distribution department. Uh, all at once, streaming became the the lead where theatrical had been the lead uh, in in distribution. Um, Arthur mentioned the waterfall. Um, and and all at once, uh, it's it's now streaming is is kind of the lead because super interesting, yeah, yeah. It's it's the biggest uh, income produ- uh, delivering window. Thomas just wrote that uh, over four million people streamed it <laughs> wow. to get the hundred twenty five million. Yeah, that was that was in the opening weekend. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's there are 120 million households in the country, about 350 million people or so in the U.S. Um, I bought it. <laughs> you, yeah, you there was too. a bunch. We did too. If you have kids, you probably did. For yeah, sure. my grand granddaughter. Right. Simple. Yeah, the global yeah. marketplace, though, is really crucial, and to be serious in the business, uh, to give you to put it in context, that part of it. Uh, the average motion picture makes about a third of their income from North America. So two thirds of it comes from outside the country. And knowing that all at once you become as a filmmaker, really focused on the other territories. Stephen mentioned that we go out and, and set the distribution for, focused on the, on the nine big, nine biggest territories which uh, the French speaking audience is, is France for sure, but there are 14 French speaking nations as well. Um, and, and it's like that for uh, other territories. So, but looking at the, and, and China, frankly, is, is uh, the largest um, earnings, entertainment earnings territory outside the US. And you might think, oh my gosh, but we have such a terrible relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, our, our motion pictures, do huge business in China. Dune is a good example. 
um, had, I think their opening weekend was 40 million, um, which isn't overly much for China for a picture, but it's still real, real serious business. And they often will out earn um, North America with, with uh, uh, big studio pictures. That can if, I could, if I could interject without name dropping, um, we have already actually uh, pitched and had a, a really, really strong reception uh, to two of the major distribution companies over there, including the, the major one. So, yeah. Can I bring you back to the numbers for one second before we uh, move yeah. on? So uh, I don't mean to focus on what can go wrong, but that helps clear mm -hmm. the way to sort of green light an investment, if I can yeah. use your parlance. The, uh, the 110 percent that gets back to the investor is that from foreign rights sales and the financing of the fifteen million dollar of the movie? How does that happen? Yeah, what a great what a great question. So Stephen mentioned that that it's coming from bank financing. Well, the banks don't take risks, so right. these licenses. Yeah, if you can borrow money from the bank, you don't, you know, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's no risk, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we look at uh, at, at the collateral that's the least cost of money, uh, and and that's what we use. We and some of them are are pre sold licenses, um, and some of them are uh, production incentives. Um, there are nine different categories that we uh, that we kind of move around until we get to the right uh, the right uh, mixture, um, and then we. Uh, then we go out and and subscribe those, back them into uh, the bank financing. We actually set things up first with a bond company uh, that guarantees the delivery of the picture for a certain price and based on the script and all of that, uh, which is crucial in the bank. And the bank, uh, the bond company actually puts together what's called an inter-party agreement that has each collateral player and they package them in there because they perform against the bond company assures that the bank is going to be paid uh, and um, they give the deliverables to each cl uh, collateral provider uh, in order to bring about the, the bank payoff. And this is huge business for banks now. Uh, and JP Morgan Chase is the biggest in this business. Uh, but Union Bank and um, Comerica and um, there, there are many banks that are involved in motion picture financing, but it's at this unique level. It's with producers that are sophisticated enough that they understand the bonding and the collateral that needs to be there. And during development, they set all these pieces up so that they'll be able to get the production bank production funding. And then the risk is substantially mitigated for the investors. That's why we wanted them to play on that level. If we if we get the production financing because the investors have put up the development money, uh, which is production money, uh, that get paid gets paid right off the top when the production uh, bank loan is let. Yeah, I think the the difference is in normal waterfall that has been confused many of us was that that money didn't get paid till after the profits of the movie <laughs> kicked in yes. and that you're allowing people to get back a, pr a pref basically on their capital right. before the rest. And it's really interesting because the, the insurance companies are in the risk business, but they want a perfected interest in collateral. And then they provide mm -hmm. a bond to a bank who doesn't want to take risk and they'll give you low cost money. And then you just bake the cost of the bond in there. I mean, I don't, I'm just trying to follow the logic here, but that sounds like it's a doable deal, right? Yeah, it is. The bond's about uh, two and a half percent now. It's competitive enough. Um, so it's it's a part of the budget, but not a big part. But from an investor's perspective, um, everybody wants to play in the back end. Everybody hopes it's a hit uh, and they can get a nice uh, a nice return on their capital. But once you've had a return of capital plus a little vigorish, you know, a uh, hundred and ten percent return, um, the you know feels pretty good. You're no longer nervous. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're no longer biting your nails, wondering if this picture is going to be strong enough to really merit uh, a huge audience, a big income that you can recover your funds plus a profit. 
John, you I, I, wanna, I you wanna grab that? Uh, we've talked a little bit about it. Do you see that Q and A there? Uh, from Kevin, is the 110% returned when the Chase Bank or East West Bank loan is funded? Which yes. we just went over, yes, but I just wanna correct. make sure we- uh, yeah, exactly, correct. exactly right. It, that money comes off the top. It's the money that was spent first in order to produce the film. It was spent during development, and that's the money that is repaid, um, just like uh, handing in your um, your expense your expense sheet. <laughs> and I just, guys, I, I just put in the comments uh, the fact that there was a video we did recently to explain this collateral breakdown. Because so many people go, collateral, what are you talking about? How do you collateralize a movie that's never been shot yet? And so we we did a video, a very detailed video with with a nice spreadsheet <laughs> uh, to explain the whole process. And I just put that in the comments so everybody can look at that, and download it. Yeah, we went through that uh, in real real detail. And and the collateral, you know, obviously, there's there's risk for um, for distributors if they take on a project and say they're going to release it uh, in their market before it's even shot. Well, if you have a script that they can review and they and you have an A director, a director that's studio level, um, that has a reputation for delivering pictures with good scripts that do well, uh, then it, it, it uh, reduces the risk considerably for, um, for, the, uh, for the licensee. And these licensees then want to see on top of that What's what's the advantage for us? And the advantage for them is that uh, they get the license for substantially less than if they got it after the picture was done. So we we license as few as possible. <laughs> we set the more th the North America distribution, and frankly, the theatrical distribution. We don't really get any capital from them for the production. We'll get a a commitment to release in a certain minimum number of screens, usually 2,500 to 3,500 screens. Uh, and we'll get a commitment to them for brand money, for the media money that they will spend in branding the movie before it comes out, which is a crucial part of the whole process. And that's often 20 to $40 million. Uh, but it's not money we can spend on production. And that's just, that totally but, but their commitment is crucial. Once we have a studio commitment, uh, we take care of the question that every international distributor asks, which is when you sit down with them, the first thing they want to know is who's handling it in the U.S. <laughs> and to be able to say it's Columbia, it's Sony, uh, or it's Universal, or it's Paramount, is just crucial. And of course, Disney. I mean, but each each one of the studios, as long as it's a major distributor, and today, frankly. If you tell them that it's uh, that it's Amazon or it's Netflix, uh, they also take that in stride because uh, they're also big, huge players. It's kind uh, of like if profiling, right? So I'm going to be accused of profiling, and it's going to be a matter of record. It's with the Chinese, for example. It's like owning a Gucci bag, right? So <laughs> yeah. The branding of yeah. Uh, yeah. of a big studio it totally makes sense. Yeah, and the studios have made a science out of evaluating pictures. When they they're before opening weekend, they're often within single digit percentages of what opening weekend is going to be. That's amazing. Hey, can I just jump in and say it's pretty cool, John? I don't know if you noticed, but Tori Kai's, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. She designed the latest edition of your book. She's just saying hi. Oh, <laughs> hi. How are you Glad doing? That, uh, your book is doing so well. <laughs> I'd, yeah, I'd like yeah, to jump yeah. in because somebody asked a question. Yeah. Um, what are the key assumptions in the green lighting process and what few things are most critical? Um, so each, each film has Thank something you, in, in the campaign of the film, the, the trailer, they show the trailer isn't just like, Hey, we do an artistic rendition of the trailer and this is to get people in. It's an actual calculated thing. It's, it's called a campaign signature and it shows how much of these particular elements are in a story, how much action, how much romance, how much um, uh, humor. What's that, John? Drama. drama, drama, yeah, dramatic tension, and and, and so when a, a movie makes a trailer, if they do it properly. This is this is called a campaign signature, and it's because it, it's they, they they're studying people and what they want to see, and so we study <clears throat> the campaign signature of many other films that are very similar to our campaign signatures. Our story has X amount of drama. What's that, John Jason? 
Dozens of films. Dozens of films. So our our film or our story, the novel, has X amount of drama, X amount of suspense, X amount of romance, X amount of humor. And through that, we can create a campaign signature. We compare our campaign signature to dozens of motion pictures in, in the recent in recent history well, to calculate what those campaigns films in particular. We don't compare them to yeah. the whole picture, but to right, their, right. Campaigns. their campaigns to see what those films have generated in, in income. And this is a process that's been used for decades. Uh, John, who was the one who who pioneered this method? Gary Reardon at Warner Brothers, uh, one of the longest running studio presidents in, in history. Um, he made a, a science out of it and it's been it's been improved over the years. It, it was just at Warner Brothers for a while and then it uh, as execs moved from studio to studio, um, so did this science and, and it, they've just made it better over the years. But it is uh, just what Stephen was saying, <clears throat> this ability to um, have comparative pictures to your picture. Um, and it's it's the campaign signature, but it's also the, the, the level of proficiency of the director. It's the cast. If it's had a novel uh, that it's based on, uh, that makes a difference. Um, Harry Potter would be a, a great example of that, but lots of other ones, including... Um, uh, including what's the picture we often compare our picture to divergent uh, hunger games hunger games uh, yeah yeah those you know to have a novel a strong novel that's out uh, in advance is a, a huge advantage and the same thing with with writing the script having a, a really strong novel especially if it's as cinematic as uh, calculated is uh, really beneficial uh, also oh, this has been super we could probably talk forever about this and i've super enjoyed it um, I, I've got a hard stop here, so uh, um, I'm going to have to wrap things up. But okay. And you're welcome, Michael, by the way. Uh, that's just a side note. The uh, um, This has been super, super interesting. And um, for someone that's a cynic, I'm now optimistic, which doesn't mean anything. It's just me. <laughs> but uh, um, I want to thank you guys for doing this. Do you want to wrap up? Somebody want to make a closing statement? I want to say one thing because I'm I'm seeing a lot of questions that weren't answered, especially uh, B- uh, Benjamin Charbet. Very good question. Sorry we didn't get to him. Just email us at um, you could do uh, J at Wonder Studios. or or info at Wonder Studios dot com. Yeah, we're going to make sure you have all everybody's information so you can connect directly with the folks here. And uh, we can do this again if you guys want, because it's been, you know, it's short period of time and uh, it's really, really cool stuff. And uh, the community appreciated it. And thank you for inviting all your friends. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just just if we could do a quick summary, Arthur, it, sure. it would be this, that it's a it's a really extraordinary story. And for it from an investor perspective, there are very few things that we can be involved in that has a reach like two and a half billion. And by the time this picture is out, these new satellite constellations that are being launched in 2022 will double the reach, almost. So it goes from 2.4 billion to about 4.6 billion all, all at once that are reached with this uh, this stature of uh, entertainment. So it's amazing that you can be involved in something that you've made happen that has that kind of reach that really is, is great entertainment. Um, uh, but also has something to say. And um, it's just, and there are very few investments in the entertainment industry that will recover your money before the picture goes into production. So, and, and it, you can't do that really if, if, if this was production funding, which we don't get from private investors, but if it was, we couldn't make that offer, but we can do it in development. Yeah. So we'd sure. love to have you involved. We're almost, uh, we're, we're almost sold out which is really awesome. We've been really blessed uh, in that regard. But we'd love to have you involved if you'd uh, care to join us. You can go on the WeFunder uh, page, look for Calculated, uh, and you can do it through there or contact us, uh, and we'd be happy to facilitate and help out. And just just so you're aware, we are going to follow this up if it does close before you get in with other investments. Yeah, we have a big reggae uh, investment coming out in January, mid-January, which is, um, yeah, anyway. Great. So uh, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Arthur. Uh, as I mentioned, 
uh, for the uh, folks that attended. If there's anybody that you know of that might want to be exposed to this, feel free to, to do that. Or Family Office Insights is not standing in the way in that, nor do we want to be uh, uh, it, in any way an, an impairment, but a catalyst. So I once again, thank you all for sharing with us. The only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Until next time.